The I've found British intellectuals insult people constantly by saying that they've made money or profited from something. Like this one guy questioning Christopher Hitchens says, uh, what keeps you writing for Vanity Fair if it's not just the gobs of money you get from them? Right? Like Christopher Hitchens has made up this whole stance against Islam and stuff so the Vanity Fair will pay him money. Large sums of money, you know, thousands of dollars a month to write a column for him. You know, is that all? Christopher Hitchens doesn't have any more invested in his moral outlook than that? Um, or the people who say that uh, uh, the government's screwing up the housing bubble thing, you know, somebody's getting rich from that. Or, or um, uh, Christopher Hitchens says that George Galloway went to Iraq and benefited monetarily from the oil for food uh, trade thingy. I don't know if he did or not. He was called before the U.S. Senate to testify, but um, it seems to me that that would be the least of of his uh, uh, transgressions. Uh, Galloway. Galloway, if he would have made some money when he went and visited Saddam, that would probably be the least of what I would morally blame him for. I mean, he advocates that uh, Western democracy is evil and that uh, Saddam just had his own little country that we shouldn't have bothered with and was doing fine and you know the stuff he advocates is far far worse than the prospect of making money somewhere off of some shady deal or something I mean so the envy in, in Western European culture is stark uh, contrast to America and uh, you can imagine then what Vietnam would be like in fact, I've seen old black and white videos of the Chinese Revolution where they have landlords, people who own uh, buildings and houses and stuff, were sitting in the middle of a, a group of people, Chinese people screaming at them and insulting them and saying, how could you, you take stuff from the people, blah, blah, blah. That's what, that's what you get for putting your, your life and your efforts into putting a house and a home over other people's heads is they blame you and hate you. You know, where would these people be without uh, landlords who spend all of their time acquiring houses to rent out? Well, they would be in houses built by the state, which is where they ended up, much less uh, well off. Um, and the same thing goes in Vietnam. So now back to the, back to the point here. Paradoxically, says this, this uh, general, uh, an effective and popular general in the Vietnamese army with loyal troops often came to be considered a political threat in a country that had experienced more than its share of military coups. This is a country that won't allow anyone to remain a hero very long, an American observer explained. But they sure could use one. So, they didn't have effective leadership. They didn't have anyone that would step up. And when anyone did step up, they were derided, hated, uh, and attacked, disliked, people tried to undermine their position and take over their power, envy. Nobody wants anyone else to succeed. Um, it's bad in France and, and, uh, and Britain and stuff, but it, it, it was so much worse in Vietnam. They weren't allowed to get effective leadership for so many reasons. That's just one of them right there. It goes over uh, maintenance men. We did leave some, some materials and stuff in Vietnam. We did equip their army pretty well. Listen to this. Compressed training periods for mechanics, get them trained as quick as possible, and difficulties in translating technical concepts and jargon made the maintenance seem an almost insurmountable problem. Um, they had to replace the helicopters. The helicopters advanced a generation in Vietnam. And the earlier helicopters didn't need as much uh, work and maintenance and were tougher and could fly longer with less uh, help but they were less sophisticated and uh, less efficient and so on so the US is replacing its its helicopters um, they replaced the Huey um, replaced the CH-34 with the Huey and they started replacing that in 1969 uh, and that, that was even more difficult for these South Vietnamese who had grown up on farms and stuff largely, grown up in agriculture and didn't have a background of mechanization. So they got to learn mechanics and stuff uh, s without a lot of background to it. 
And then they've got to learn extraordinarily sophisticated mechanical engineering uh, stuff uh, over and above the stuff they already weren't handling very well. And then Americans leave. It didn't, it didn't work out. Now, skip a few pages. You've heard of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The trail, says one American officer, a frustrated American officer, the trail is any way that the enemy can get down to the south. The trail is a state of mind. It's a philosophy. End quote. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was the infiltration from the north to the south. Supplies and stuff and fighters got down there. Not a trail, actually. Just simply, like he says, a way to get down anything that got you down to the south. You were said to have come on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. 90 kilometers wide at some point. It's 40, 50 miles wide. The Ho Chi Minh Trail spread out over Laos like a spider web. Its strands may have totaled 13,000 kilometers in length. Now, the U.S. intelligence claimed that it had mapped all 3,500 uh, miles of it, all 5,600 kilometers, but the North boasted that they had actually built 13,000 kilometers of trail and road. So for the North, for, this, for the Americans to say they had mapped 6,000 kilometers, um, yeah, there you go. So it might have been exaggeration on the communist part. They've been known to do that. All right, so the, the build-up alarmed the uh, Americans in the South Vietnamese. Sorry, we, we do skip a bit. We skip a few pages. They were building up, the, nor the North was building up their forces. It alarmed the, the Americans in the South Vietnamese, who believed it might presage an offensive at the end of the Laotian dry season. Um, or in the U.S. election year in 1972. So either this year or next year, they're probably going to use these forces they're building up, they figure. A preemptive strike was a tempting idea, reflecting General Abrams' proclivity for attacking the enemy's logistics nose, right? They're sticking their nose out there. MACV told Washington that a major disruption of the communist supply system for one dry season might hamper the North's ability to launch an offensive for one year and possibly longer. So now we're just picking short term. I mean, this is really at the end of the war. And we're basically, we've told everybody we're leaving. But uh, we're saying now at the, we're going to try to disrupt them so it's more difficult for them to launch offensives. I mean, what if we would have done that with Hitler? We're going to try to disrupt Hitler so he can't launch as many offensives. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, uh, we mentioned earlier that no American troops were fighting outside Vietnam. Uh, quote, since the American troops were barred by the Cooper Church Amendment from fighting outside Vietnam, South Vietnamese troops alone would have to carry the battle into Laos, although they were assisted by Americans. Such an invasion promised important military and political dividends for the Americans. Militarily, it not only would thwart an enemy offensive, but also would stand as a test of the first phase of Vietnamization, right? See if they can launch the attack and carry it out, carry it out with their own soldiers. Since a successful foray into the enemy stronghold would confirm the modernization and self-reliance of ARVN troops. Wait a minute. Of the enemy stronghold? Now, that would confirm that the South Vietnamese troops were coming along well. The enemy stronghold? Laos? Really? So... The Cooper Church Amendment forbade American soldiers fighting anywhere but in Vietnam, and the enemy stronghold was in Laos. Do you, do, you get, do you see why we lost the war? Politically, a success on the scale of the Cambodian incursion was likely to permit a more rapid withdrawal of American combat forces from Vietnam. The lure was irresistible, ir irresistible and the MACV and the Vietnamese... Uh, joint general staff went to work on preliminary planning. Now, Nixon agreed with the military. He said it's clogged with supplies for the enemy. Uh, Laos is clogged with supplies. Um, but he was cautious about widening the war. Um, the Cambodian incursion had been a problem, and now they're going to do a Laos incursion. This time, he, quote, this time he determined to bring all his key cabinet officers and advisors together to ride out the inevitable public storm. So we're all together in a group. We'll take comfort in he, that's Nixon for you. That he would do that.